In the Book of Mormon, did Solomon Spalding write the Gozellum passage? When the Book of Mormon was written, the official narrative was that, by means of spectacles, it was translated. Joseph Smith History 133 through 35. He called me by name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me, and that his name was Moroni, that God had to work for me to do, and that my name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, or that it should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. He said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent, and the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants, also, that there were two stones and silver bows, and these stones, fastened to a breastplate, constituted what is called the Urim and Thummim, deposited with the plates, and the possession and use of these stones were what constituted seers in ancient or former times, and that God had prepared them for the purpose of translating the book. Mosiah 28 11 through 16 Therefore he took the records which were engraven on the plates of brass, and also the plates of Nephi, and all the things which he had kept and preserved according to the commandments of God, after having translated and caused to be written the records which were on the plates of gold which had been found by the people of Limhi, which were delivered to him by the hand of Limhi, and this he did because of the great anxiety of his people, for they were desirous beyond measure to know concerning those people who had been destroyed. And now he translated them by the means of those two stones which were fastened into the two rims of a bow. Now these things were prepared from the beginning, and were handed down from generation to generation, for the purpose of interpreting languages, and they have been kept and preserved by the hand of the Lord, that he should discover to every creature who should possess the land the iniquities and abominations of his people, and whosoever has these things is called seer, after the manner of old times. Notice that the foregram, the great anxiety of, is found in both Solomon's Spalding and the Book of Mormon. About two thousand made good their escape, and carried the doleful tidings of Samuel's death and the slaughter of his army to their own land, and indeed their escape was owing to the great anxiety of Elzion and his warriors to visit their friends in the fort and to ascertain the extent of the massacre that Samuel and his army had made. Solomon Spalding, Manuscript Story, Oberlin Manuscript, page 169. Notice, when speaking of the spectacles, that the Book of Mormon shifts from plural to singular, perhaps implying fatigue and an interpolation, the stone being Solomon Spalding and the spectacles being Joseph Smith and Sidney Ridden, Alma 37 20 through 26. Therefore I command you, my son Elamon, that ye be diligent in fulfilling all my words, and that ye be diligent in keeping the commandments of God as they are written. And now I will speak unto you concerning those twenty four plates, that ye keep them, that the mysteries and the works of darkness and their secret works, or the secret works of those people which have been destroyed, may be made manifest unto this people, yea, all their murders and robbings and their plunderings and all their wickedness and abominations may be made manifest unto this people, yea, and that ye preserve these directors. For behold, the Lord saw that his people began to work in darkness, yea, work secret murders and abominations. Therefore the Lord said, If they did not repent, they should be destroyed from off the face of the earth. And the Lord said, I will prepare unto my servant Gazellum a stone which shall shine forth in darkness unto light, that I may discover unto my people which serve me, that I may discover unto them the works of their brethren, yea, their secret works, their works of darkness, and their wickedness and abominations. And now, my son, these directors were prepared that the word of God might be fulfilled which he spake, saying, I will bring forth out of darkness unto light all their secret works and their abominations. And except they repent, I will destroy them from off the face of the earth. And I will bring to light all their secrets and abominations unto every nation which shall hereafter possess the land. And now, my son, we see that they did not repent, therefore they have been destroyed. And thus far, the word of God hath been fulfilled, yea, their secret abominations have been brought out of darkness and made known unto us, including the three gram, a stone which the similarities between the book of Mormon's Gazellum and Solomon's Paulding's Hamak are undeniable. Drophil again did his prophecy, Hamak then arose and in his hand he held a stone which he pronounced transparent, though it was not transparent to common eyes. Through this he could view things present and things to come, could behold the dark intrigues and cabals of foreign courts, and discover hidden treasures, secluded from the eyes of other mortals. He could behold the gallants and his mistress in their bedchamber and count all their moles, warts, and pimples. Such was the clearness of his sight when this transparent stone was placed before his eyes. He looked fiercely and steadfastly on the stone and raised his prophetic voice. I behold Hambun with all his priests and great officers assembled around him, with what contempt he declares he despises all the Seedans. They are, says he, cowards and paltroons. They dare not face my brave warriors. Here I see four men coming forward bearing an image formed with all the fetters of ugliness and deformity. This they call Sambal, the king of Sarah. The whole company break forth into boisterous laughing. Ah, see, and they are cutting off his head with their swords, yes, and are now kicking it about the palace. Here is a pole it is stuck upon that and carried through the city. Oh, my loving sparks, Elzion and Lamessa, what makes you so merry? Why, Elzion says he has outwitted the Seedans. He has got the prize and he little regards their resentment. Hamak was proceeding with such nonsensical visions when the multitude interrupted him with a cry, Revenge, revenge, we will convince the Kentuckians that we are not cowards or paltroons, their heads shall pay for their sport in kicking about the pretended head of our beloved king. Solomon Spalding, Manuscript Story, Oberlin Manuscript, page 126. The name Gazellum is found in books which Solomon Spalding was most likely to have read. Gazellum, Samuel Wesley, baptized the 17th of December 1662 to the 25th of April 1735, Rector of Eport and Decessi Lincolnian Anglicanism, Church of England, he was also the father of John Wesley and Charles Wesley, founders of Methodism, Dissertations in Le Rongeau 1736, Dissertatio the 11th, page 91. We then come to the river of Arcus, and after that the people of the Capadocians, the towns of Yaziara and Gazellum, Pliny the Elder, 23 to 79 AD, Natural History, Book 6, Chapter 2. Given that the Gazellum passage was in the original Spalding manuscript, it becomes highly probable that Sidney Ridden, through Gadius Stafford, was introduced to Joseph Smith and believed that Joseph was prophetically shown to him as the one, Gazellum, who should bring forth the Book of Mormon. I was born in Palomyra, New York, near where old Joe Smith settled, January 4, 1807. I attended school with Prophet Joe. His father taught me to mow. I worked with old and young Joe at farming. I have frequently seen old Joe drunk. Young Joe had a fork witch hazel rod with which he claimed he could locate buried money or hidden things. Later he had a peepstone which he put into his hat and looked into it. I have seen both. Joshua Stafford, a good citizen, told me that young Joe Smith and himself dug for money in his orchard and elsewhere nights. All the money digging was done nights. I saw the holes in the orchard which were four or five feet square and three or four feet deep. Joe and other dug much about Pal, Myra, and Manchester. I have seen many of the holes. The first thing he claimed to find was gold plates of the Book of Mormon, which he kept in a pillowcase and would let people lift, but not see. I came to Ohio in 1818 and became acquainted with Sidney Ridden in 1820. He preached my brother's funeral sermon in Auburn, Ohio, in May, 1822. I returned to Pal, Myra twice and res
Signed, Isaac Butts, South Newberry, Goga County, Ohio, 1885. Gaddius Stafford is included in the list of pioneer Mormon disciples. These pioneer Mormon disciples, so far as their names can now be recollected, were as follows, viz. Oliver Cowdery, Samuel Lawrence, Martin Harris, Preserve Harris, Peter Ingersoll, Charles Ford, George Proper and his wife Dolly, of Palmyra, Zeba Peterson, and Calvin Stoddard and his wife Sophronia, of Mason, Ezra Thayer, of Brighton, Lumen Walters, of Paltneville, Hiram Page, of Fayette, David Widmer, Jacob Widmer, Christian Widmer, John Widmer, and Peter Widmer, Jr., of Phelps, Simeon Nichols, of Farmington, William Stafford, Joshua Stafford, Gad Stafford, David Fish, Abram Fish, Robert Orr, King H. Quans, John Morgan, Oren Rockwell and his wife Caroline, widow Sally Risley, and all the remainder of the Smith family, of Manchester. Pomeroy Tucker, 1802-1870, Origin, Rise, and Progress of Mormonism, NYC, D. Appleton and Company, 1867, Chapter 4, pages 38-39. through 39. Abram H. Stafford, a well-known farmer of Chardon Township, was born in Goga County, Ohio, March 31, 1841. His father, Reuben Stafford, was born near Palmyra, New York, in 1812, and his grandfather, Gadia Stafford, was also a native of New York State. The latter emigrated to Ohio and settled at Auburn, Goga County, in 1824. He took up land there, but afterward came to Chardon Township and bought land on which he lived several years, removing to Michigan, where he died at the age of 75 years. He was a soldier in the War of 1812. Biographical History of Northeastern Ohio, embracing the counties of Ashtabula, Goga and Lake, 1893, Stafford, A.H. page 947. From Isaac Butt's statement above, we see that, in Auburn, in May of 1822, Sidney Rigdon preached. It, therefore, is extremely probable that before the publication of the Book of Mormon, Sidney Rigdon and Gadia Stafford knew each other. Given the statements of William Stafford and that of Joshua Stafford, found in Mormonism unveiled, both they and Gad Stafford likely participated in the money-digging efforts. 1. Gadia Stafford was born on the 10th of September 1789 in Rhode Island or New York. He died on the 2nd of July 1862 in Wheatland Township, Hillsdale County, Missouri. Gadia and Lydia Stafford moved to Auburn Township, Go County, Ohio in 1924 and purchased of Perkins, just east of the center, on the Kirkland Tract. They lived there until 1838 and then moved to Chardon Township. They may have moved to Hillsdale Co., Wheatland Township, Missouri about 1842 but are shown in Chardon, Ohio for the 1850 census. Goga County, Ohio Post Aquarius for June through July 1998. Notice that Gadia lived just east of the center, on the Kirkland Tract. Joshua had to keep stone, Mrs. M. C. R. Smith's statement, I was born in Belchertown, Mass. May 1st, 1812. When I was five or six years old, my parents moved to Manchester, New York, one mile from the Mormon Smith family, and I attended school with their children. There was considerable digging for money in our neighborhood by men, women, and children. I never knew of their finding any. I saw a large hole dug on Nathaniel Smith's farm, which was sandy. I saw Joshua Stafford's peepstone, which looked like white marble and had a hole through the center. Sally Chase, a Methodist, had one, and people would go for her to find lost and hidden or stolen things. My mother was one of the first Mormon converts. Father copied the Book of Mormon for the printer, or part of it. I heard Martin Harris say that the first part of the Book of Mormon was stolen and that he thought his wife took it and it was not printed in the Book of Mormon. Father joined the Mormons after my parents went west. Catherine Smith, sister of the prophet, showed me in their house a chest with lock where the plates were kept, but they feared they would be stolen, and then she took off four bricks in the hearth and said they had been buried there. Joe Smith's mother doctored many persons in Palomira. My sister, with whom mother died in California, was opposed to her being a Mormon. I hope sometime it will be known whether Mormonism is true or not. My brother, Oren Porter Rockwell, made me a visit in 1844 or 45. When ten years old he broke his leg and a young doctor in Palomira said it so one leg was shorter than the other and it always troubled him so he could not work at farming. Signed, Mrs. M. C. R. Smith. Witnessed by A. B. Demon, B. N. Shaw. Hamden, Ohio, March 25, 1885. Along with Isaac Butts, many more people claimed that, before Mormonism, Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith knew each other. A mysterious stranger now appears at Smith's residence and holds private interviews with the far famed money digger. For a considerable length of time, no intimation of the name or purpose of this person transpired to the public, not even to Smith's nearest neighbors. It was observed by some of them that his visits were frequently repeated. The sequel of these private interviews between the stranger and the money digger will sufficiently appear hereafter. Pomeroy Tucker, 1802 to 1870, Origin, Rise, and Progress of Mormonism, NYC, D. Appleton and Company, 1867, Chapter 3. Page 28. Great consternation now pervaded the Mormon circles. The reappearance of the mysterious stranger at Smith's was again the subject of inquiry and conjecture by observers, from whom was withheld all explanation of his identity or purpose. Pomeroy Tucker, 1802-1870, Origin, Rise, and Progress of Mormonism, NYC, D. Appleton and Company, 1867, Chapter 4, Page 46. Some six months passed when the announcement was given out that a new and complete translation of the Book of Mormon had been made by the Prophet, which was ready for the press. In the interim the stranger before spoken of had again been seen at Smith's, and the Prophet had been away from home, maybe to repay the former's visits. Pomeroy Tucker, 1802-1870, Origin, Rise, and Progress of Mormonism. NYC, D. Appleton and Company, 1867, Chapter 5, page 48, that in March of 1827, on or about the 15th of said month, I went to the house of Joseph Smith for the purpose of getting some maple sugar to eat, that when I arrived at the house of said Joseph Smith, I was met at the door by Harrison Smith, Joe's brother, that at a distance of 10 or 12 rods from the house there were five men that were engaged in talking, four of whom I knew, the fifth one was better dressed than the rest of those whom I was acquainted with. I inquired of Harrison Smith who the stranger was. He informed me his name was Sidney Rigdon, with whom I afterwards became acquainted and found to be Sidney Rigdon. Signed. Lorenzo Saunders, seal, sworn and subscribed to before me this 21st day of July, 8, 1887. Linus S. Parmelee, Justice of the Peace of Reading, Michigan.